Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 536 of the podcast and it is Sunday the 28th of February 2021 as I record this and spring is almost here, yay! (laughs) In today's show I'm talking to Patrick O'Donnell from Cops and Writers on how to write authentic crime fiction. We talk about creating three-dimensional characters for the police in your books and also about conflict, survivor's guilt, ideas for plots that are underused, the double-edged sword of technology, as well as some of the aspects of the job that you might write about and what TV and movies get wrong. So that is coming up in the interview segment. In publishing news, well, I attended a great webinar with Ingram Content this week, which was aimed at uh, publishers, basically, and it was all about optimising for online sales, and I was very interested in (laughs) what they were going to talk about. So it contains some statistics about online shopping. Over 80% of people in the US have bought online in the last month, up. Uh, I can't remember the number, but it was like, wow, this is a big shift. 95% of people research purposes or uh, purchases online and 50% have used mobile devices to buy something. In 2020, 30% of all retail was e-commerce. And they noted that this is a dramatic shift in consumer behavior and has actually had the effect of shifting traffic away from Amazon. And this was really interesting. And I've noticed this with my own behavior is that uh, place stores that I would shop at um, in person, I now go to their website to see Cotswold Outdoor would be an example for me. You know, I buy lots of outdoor gear for walking and all of that. And uh, I would normally just pop around to the Cotswold shop. And before the pandemic, I never shopped online with Cotswold, but I have done in the last year. So basically, people assume that they can buy online from other retailers, so they will go to that site first uh, in order to uh, support that retailer or or just to get specific uh, deals or whatever. Uh, The other interesting thing was books, music and video was the highest category of online purchases in 2020, with 62% bought online, which is interesting, and 67% of book sales were backlist. So books over a year old, which is a real change, and the web was basically about making the most of your backlist. Now, their tips were nothing new for Indies. Well, just to return to that 67%. So think about the publishing model before the pandemic, which was new books arrive in bookstores, go on tables, and that's the push. And debut authors, that's the push, who only have one book. And uh, you know, all this stuff was really designed for debut authors and also for new releases from other authors going on these front tables and buying placements and all of this type of thing. And this 67% being backlist means that older books and authors with a backlist, so authors with a lot more books than just one, actually do better. And this is something that indies know and why, you know, for example, I don't even make that much of a big deal about a new release anymore because I know that I'll make some money on launch, but the bulk of the money is from the backlist and people discovering all your other books. So this was this was really interesting. Uh, their tips included, oh, and to be honest, their tips were nothing new for indies. What was more of a concern was their tips were nothing new for indies, but clearly are new for a lot of these publishers. <laughs> so we're going to see a lot more. Uh, well, I don't know whether we will see a, a lot more... Um, competition. I don't really believe in it in that way. I think more books is better for all of us because people can find ours as they look for different stuff. But uh, anyway, their tips included covering all formats in all channels in all stores. They very much did promote that. Optimise your metadata and consider paid advertising, as well as a renewed emphasis on selling direct. And this is really the first time I've heard this in a publishing webinar, um, which is really about why not build direct to consumer channels. And again, we've been talking about that for a while. And you can find my tutorial at thecreativepen.com forward slash sell direct tutorial. So yes, perhaps the 
publishers, traditional publishers will be playing more in our pond, the digital pond. And uh, however, I find it hard enough to maintain the metadata in my own small catalogue. <laughs> so they will really need to change things technically to do things on a bigger scale because, of course, Ingram were like, you should do this and this and this with your metadata, which is your title, description, your keywords, your categories and all this. And you should uh, change them up and keep them active and all these things. And I can imagine a publisher sitting there with tens of thousands of books on their backlist going, uh, don't think that's going to work for us. Or we have all have to recruit people to do that. So interesting. And there's also another report, the Immersive Books and Media 2020 Research Report, uh, which Publishers Weekly reported on, and you you can download it uh, for free. Uh, It says, this is the first of its kind study to examine consumer engagement with books alongside consumption of television, movies and video games, which is interesting because uh, this is definitely the world we're competing against. This is where I believe there really is true competition. The true competition is us collectively the book industry against television, uh, movies, video games and other things, other forms of entertainment. So they said, avid book engagers, i.e. people who read four plus books per month, are more ethnically diverse and younger than the general survey population, which is interesting. The demographics for the industry to watch are black and Latinx, uh, millennials and men. (laughs) And I know everyone's like, whoa, what happened there? Because they say they engage with more books than middle class boomer women, except in the context of book gifting. And this is one of those findings that is is actually jaw dropping in the publishing industry because the assumption has been for I don't know a long long time that middle class middle aged white women like me <laughs> are the biggest demographic. Now of course we're a big demographic, but this was interesting because it was an immersive report which presumably looked at a different demographic than is normally looked at in publishing studies. So I found found this to be really fascinating. They also said readers of audiobooks and ebooks are multitasking. 70% for audiobooks, 61% for ebooks. Now, this is interesting too because audiobooks absolutely I never my husband just will lie there in bed at night listening to a fantasy novel. It's what he does for his evening reading. I never do that. I will always be doing something else while listening to an audiobook. So cooking or doing chores or walking or whatever, or exercising. Uh, but ebooks, I'm like, how do you do how do you multitask while writing reading an ebook? Maybe you're watching TV at the same time or whatever? I, I don't know. Also, book pirates are customers. 41% of book pirates not only buy books, they also buy the same book in multiple formats. And this this actually, the whole piracy discussion has been going on for a long, long time. But, um, you know, I remember when Paolo Coelho, for example, uh, released one of his books in Russia on the pirate sites and had a massive uptick in sales in Russia. And uh, there are definitely authors who say, look, you can't stop the pirates and you know this is interesting because some of them go on to buy also libraries bookstores and online channels mutually reinforce each other leading to engagement and sales i think we all knew that (laughs) i don't know why that's news and browsing online bookstores has overtaken browsing in physical stores for the number one way to discover books, with over 30% preferring online browsing to around 18% preferring physical stores. And this, again, is a huge deal. Now, whether this will change, and again, remember this was in America for a start, but uh, I think this behaviour will only continue because obviously we know it, you know, if we, I've been browsing online for a long time. You have so much more inventory online than you do in a physical store. Now, I still go into physical stores and buy when I can. Bookstores haven't been open since, what, November or maybe early December here. So I guess the upshot of this is make sure your books are in print and buyers are buying more print online. They're browsing online. They're looking at finding deep backlist titles. And a book is always new to the person, to the reader who has just found it. So yeah, I think this is very exciting. I think we're going to see, I've certainly had, I know it's not been a great year for many, many, many reasons. Bad year in so many ways, but good year for book sales. This is this is, has been my best year for book sales in a, in a long time. So, uh, and I know that's true for a lot of people as well as more people have been reading books and buying books and discovering books. So 
Let's have the silver lining. I like to think of silver lining things. Okay, so a couple of other things. The Alliance of Independent Authors blog has an interesting in-depth article on Audible subscription earnings, which goes into detail on the four categories of payments you get from ACX. This kind of forensic accounting is so much work, and it's not something that most of us could even try and do. So thanks to Colleen Cross and the team behind the Fair Deal for Rights Holders and Narrators uh, and Hash Audible Gate. So yes, go, I'll link to that in the show notes. It's on the selfpublishingadvice.org blog. But uh, very, very interesting how that works. And uh, this is definitely not going away. <laughs> not at all. Uh, I also wanted to mention a scam. Now, uh, this scam popped up last year. I think I mentioned it on the show. Maybe I didn't. But essentially, scammers impersonating major publishing houses was going around. Now, um, this week it happened to me and I wanted to share it because I had a brief moment of thinking it was real. And if someone like me who knows that this can happen and is very experienced in the industry, if I can feel this way, then this is a good scam, as in an effective scam, and I don't want you or anyone else to fall for it. Okay, so basically, I got a phone call, and I never answer my phone unless I recognise the number. Uh, and so the the it went to voicemail, and I listened, and it was a very official, confident woman. Her name was Nora, and uh, she was like, uh, "I'm from Picador, um, Picador Media Works." And uh, your, we, we love your fiction. We think we can take it mainstream. We recognize the potential of your books. And, uh, and then they so she left a message and she said, I'll follow up with an email. So it all sounded very professional. <laughs> and then I got an email and the email was essentially had all this stuff. And it said it included a, a whole paragraph, which is essentially Picador is the winner of the imprint of the year at the British Book Awards. And it had all the information about Picador, the imprint of Pan Macmillan <laughs> in the email. And basically, uh, arrange, you know, wanting to arrange a follow up call to discuss my books and all of this. So I was like, this is really interesting. And first of all, I was like, well, that's interesting. Maybe Picador are doing what some companies are and sort of picking up backlist books and uh, putting them under another sort of sub imprint. But I know of Picador uh, and Pan Macmillan. And so the name made me think that this was not a scam. But then, uh, so basically what I did, well, there there were, first of all, there were a couple of typos in the email, but because it had all this stuff about Picador, I, I believed it. So I uh, I replied to the email and said, um, uh, be happy to arrange a time for you to call back. Give me some options, which is what I do, because I always assume people are in different time zones, although they said winner of the imprint of the year at the British Book Awards. So I thought they should be in England. And uh, then the time zones they gave me were essentially... Asian time zones, which means uh, only the morning in the UK. And I was like, okay, that's odd because Pan Macmillan Picador would not be in Asia. So that was interesting. Then I remembered this scam from uh, that Victoria Strauss at Writer Beware uh, talked about last year, which was scammers impersonating major publishers. So I went to the list and there's about 200 companies now impersonating <laughs> uh, big publishers. The one I was, this one, Picador Media Works, was not on the list. But uh, by now I had decided that this was one of the scams and sent it along to Victoria. And now it's on that website I'll link to it in the show notes so you can see it. But it's essentially scammers impersonating major publishers. <laughs> and I basically, uh, I responded to their email with, um, hello, if if you can confirm in writing that you are the real Picador from Pan Macmillan, then I'm happy to talk to you. However, if you are a <laughs> scam company based in the Philippines, uh, you know, please don't call. <laughs> And they never called, obviously. But the fact is, they had my phone number, my personal phone number, which is actually quite difficult to find, and my personal email, again, difficult to find. So this, they, I don't know where they're getting their data from, but uh, yeah, if I had not 
been embedded in the industry as I am, I may well have had a call with them and they are a scam company. So there you go. I wanted to tell you about it mainly because I'm I'm embarrassed. And if I'm embarrassed about it, then other people are going to fall for this and not talk about it because, you know, I talk about stuff. So anyway, there you go. Scammers impersonating major publishers. So in personal news, I am in extreme finishing energy mode on way too many things at once. I'm still recording and editing the audiobook for How to Make a Living with Your Writing, the third edition, uh, coming soon. 15th of March, it will be out hopefully in all formats. Plus formatting, checking the print editions, which is always such a pain for nonfiction, for the paperback, because you have to go through the paperback and print it. It's really good to print your Uh, books to check them and then uh, the large print you have to do it again because of course large print changes all the font and all of that so that's fun I'm also got another German book coming your author business plan in German so wrangling that it's it's like wrangling translation yeah translation is a wrangling act obviously I'm not doing the translation I can't even read it but I'm wrangling all the different people involved plus I'm getting the Map Walker Fantasy Trilogy sorted as well in uh, ebook, print and audiobook. And all of these things are about being a good publisher and making the most of intellectual property. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of very detailed stuff on websites and formatting and emailing backwards and forwards and checking things and uploading things. And oh, yeah, but happily it is spring as I mentioned and uh, yesterday I even started to uh, uh, clean the kitchen cupboards which I don't normally do stuff like that but it's been a year since the pandemic I thought this would make you guys laugh (laughs) so do you remember the beginning days of the pandemic when we all thought it was truly the apocalypse and I certainly I think I've admitted this you know I did buy lots of tinned food and uh, even bought things like water purification tablets I've always had got extra water in the house and uh, all of this type of stuff and (laughs) so I went through all my pandemic tins And I was thinking about this. I was thinking, okay, and I had obviously have to throw stuff away when they're out of date and stuff. And so I've ordered more pandemic tins just in case, apocalypse apocalypse tin tins. And then I was thinking, okay, so one really good to have. I obviously I heard about the stuff in Texas and some people didn't have water and couldn't get out to get food and things. And so having obviously your emergency stuff is important. But then I thought, you know, in zombie movies and post apoc movies and books, obviously, there's a, a genre trope, which is the the heroes have to go and find food and they go into a house and they have to go through the cupboards and hopefully find some tins where they can find food. So I was thinking, do you know, I'm, I'm really just filling my apocalypse cupboard uh, either for us to survive or for the people who come after the apocalypse and need to find canned food. So there you go. <laughs> There's my reason for filling my apocalypse cupboard. <laughs> oh, fun. I am truly trying to see the positive side of things at the moment and the weather is making it a lot better here and also the fact that the uh, restrictions are still continuing here but the weather is getting better which is so good and the vaccine rollout continues and I am attempting to clear the decks really by the end of March so that I can focus on doing stuff outside with other people and traveling and doing all the things that I would love to do we would all love to do Uh, trying not to get too excited. (laughs) But yes, I am booking stuff where I can. Ah, I don't know. I I, I think we all need some hope, right? We all need the hope. Also, I hope you enjoyed the extra show last week on writing with GPT-3 with Paul Bello. And uh, that was really, and I did an extra intro and also an extra chat afterwards about all of that. So um, I have a couple more episodes coming in the, this limited series of extra AI related interviews. And then I'm going to circle back in six months or so or do occasional extra episodes like like I've been doing as the tools improve even more and that that's really what the ecosystem is now turning out to be so to me gpt3 is the en- an engine and we're going to have a lot of these uh, natural language generation engines and then people are building tools on top of those engines and we are going to be using the tools rather than the engines uh, which is fascinating so yes you can check that out. That's uh, That came out this week. Also, if you like some more listening, I was on the Music Tectonics podcast this week. It's my first music podcast that I've been on, talking about the audio ecosystem. 
and the opportunities for creatives. And the Music Tectonics podcast is about the intersection of music and technology. So definitely talk about a lot of the things that, that I do uh, for the music for the music industry. And I'm also on the Rebel Author podcast talking about your author business plan with Sasha Black. So I'm everywhere. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Everyone was loving Sarah Rosette's interview. Matt Nunez says, perfect timing. This is exactly what I needed. This podcast is so positive that you can't help but be motivated to keep at it. Excellent. And Kim is writing said, I loved this so much. In fact, all the podcasts this year have really knocked it out the park. Thank you, Kim. Gradually getting out of my not writing funk and these really help. Stan Dubin said, all of your podcasts are good, all are helpful, some really stand out. The show with Sarah Rosette was loaded with great advice. Kirsten Lillis says, nodding along to this week's episode with Sarah Rosette as I colour with my toddler. I've sent a lovely picture there of the colouring. Encouraging to know someone else who finds success writing in the cracks of time motherhood allows. And finally, from Katerina Meyer, who says, after weeks and weeks of lockdown rural walks, I craved an urban setting. Listening to the Sarah Rosetta on the podcast, I think Morgan Sierra would enjoy an adventure set here in Vienna. And it's funny you say that, Katerina, because this week on the Books and Travel podcast, I have an interview on Vienna. And I certainly I'm planning one day in Vienna. I mean, I've got one day in Budapest, which is, you know, reasonably close. I have things set in um, in the Czech Republic. So, you know, I'm getting I'm, I'm getting close to Vienna and definitely planning to come. So today's show is sponsored by Findaway Voices, which I use to distribute my wide audiobooks to library apps, subscription services globally, and to help me sell direct. The audiobook market is increasingly splintered with listeners choosing from multiple options, and Findaway Voices can get your books onto 42 different retailers and subscription services and all these different things, including all the big ones. So yes, you can still get into Audible and Apple Books and Kobo and Walmart, Storytel, Google Play, Scribd, and many more retailers, but also those library apps. And this is a a game changer. The pandemic has been a game changer for digital library lending and borrowing and, and searching. In fact, that report I was talking about, the Ingram report, said that browsing on library systems is also a way that people are discovering things. So having your ebooks and audiobooks in libraries, I mean, come on. <laughs> We're, we've been supported so much by libraries as readers that I think we should be supporting libraries as writers. And so I love that Findaway Voices gets our books into all those catalogues. Now, Find A Way can also help you find the best way to produce your audiobook. You can narrate yourself and just upload the files, which is what I do with my nonfiction. Or you can work with a narrator privately and also upload the files. Or you can use their full service production model um, and even use Voices Share, which is their royalty split deal if you want to do that. Um, so I did this for the Map Walker series, again, which I'm just uploading the trilogy, but the individual books and um, I... I really struggled to find the right voice for those books. I in my head I had something and I I just was really struggling. So I used Findaway Voices service. What they do is you give them a you know some information about your book and then they will give you a whole load of samples with the prices as well. So you can see and you listen to them all and then you the you can pick several and they can do an audition. And when I found uh, Charlie Sanderson, who's my narrator, I was like, yes, she's the voice of these books. And it's it's so good to feel that. It's like, yes, and she did a great job and I just love the books and they're they're all available now. So you don't have to be exclusive to any retailer. If you use Findaway, you are you can you're basically non-exclusive, and you can control your price, which is fantastic. They also have a price recommendation thing, which will help you work it out. You can also take part in promotions like Chirp Books, run by BookBub, which you can only do if you are wide. And in fact, I have had my best audio month ever <laughs> with a Chirp deal because it really, really shifts books. Um, uh, ebooks, eh, sorry, audiobooks, <laughs> chirpers, audiobooks. And um, at the moment, given where we are in the audiobook space, it's much cheaper to advertise audiobooks than it is with audio, with ebooks. So, yeah, I'm very happy with Chirp and with Findaway. And they also do promos with libraries and other retailers that you can submit your books to. 
So yes, I use Find A Way for all my wide audiobooks and slowly, slowly I'm getting back my early ones which were uh, exclusive and figuring that out. I love the platform. I love the freedom to create and sell my audio to the world. So if you want to see the possibilities for your book projects, take back your freedom at findawayvoices.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons and especially the limited series of AI related interviews, basically all supported by my patrons who pay for my brain and my thinking time. So thanks to new patrons in the last week, Tiffany Dickinson, Victoria LK Williams, Michael Brent Collings. Thank you, Michael Brent, who also happens to be one of my favourite horror writers. So that's always thrilling. Josh Killen, Megan Dahl and Lynn Lee. Thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, especially if you've been supporting the show for months or even years. I know many of you now have been supporting since way back 2015, which is very impressive. Thank you so much. It demonstrates you find the show useful and you want it to continue. And you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio, which I do is like 40, 40 minutes, 45 minutes of me answering questions from patrons. And that's a private audio. Um, so yeah, I answer all of them as personally and as best I can. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Patrick O'Donnell is a retired American police sergeant and the author of the Cops and Writers reference books for authors and screenwriters, as well as a technical consultant for crime and police procedural novels. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Joanna, for having me on your show. It's great to have you here. And I know people have so many questions. But before we get into it, tell us a bit more about you and why you decided to uh, get into helping writers after being in the police so long. First off, I just want to thank you again. This is an honor and a privilege to be on your show. You were one of the first podcasts I ever listened to about self-publishing, and that's what really piqued my interest. So I have to oh, thank good. you publicly for that. <laughs> it was you, you and uh, you know, Johnny, Sean, and Dave, their podcast. Oh, way back in the day, although it is yes. back now. The Story Studio <laughs> podcast is back. <laughs> And remember uh, Simon Whistler, um, rocking self-publishing. Self-publishing, yeah. Oh, yes. wow. you've, you've been around a while then. <laughs> yeah, I have. I've been lurking in the shadows. Yes. But yeah, I just wanted to thank you because all the information that you had out there was very informative and it really sparked my imagination and got me into this. Hey, I owe you. So a little bit about myself. I live in Wisconsin, about an hour and a half northwest of Chicago, Illinois, if that gives somebody a frame of reference. I live there with my wife and three dogs. I'm an empty nester with four adult kids and one grandchild. I am now retired from the Milwaukee Police Department. As far as what I do, I love working out. I was listening to your podcast uh, maybe two or three episodes ago with the uh, doctor about wellness for... Mm. Um, Dr. Ewan and Lawson. Yes. And I was just like, oh, good. Joanna's lifting weights. That's what I do. Good for you. Because... <laughs> Probably you know, not as big a weights as you do. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're out there doing it. And then I thought your shoulder was hurting and I've torn my rotator cuff twice. I'm doing a lot better now, but it is a lot of retraining posture as a writer. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because in the police, obviously health is a really important thing uh, and you have to pass various fitness tests. But I also think that that is something that people have in their mind as a stereotype as for cops, right? In America, certainly <laughs> it's the fat cop eating a donut. And that is true. Coffee. That is true. Yeah, this seems to me one of the biggest problems with writing and it is the the police character whether it's a good guy or a bad guy or female or whatever <laughs> Jen, you have this cops and writers facebook group where people ask you loads of questions so can we start mm -hmm. with that one what are the most common things that people get wrong about people in the police as far as like characters go probably the one thing that really pops out at me is how one-dimensional they make their characters it's either they're the angry, loner, borderline crazy detective who breaks all the rules to get his man, like Martin Riggs, Mel Gibson from Lethal Weapon. And in reality, he would have been fired and criminally charged. That It just doesn't happen like that. Or you have the polar opposite, who you have the stoic detective or police officer that's more like an android with no sense of humor, no emotion, 
all business. And another thing that you see is they're always on the job. They almost have no outside life. So that it just isn't true to life as far as that goes. Mm. And what, what about the sort of alcoholic, drug addict, that kind of broken character? Well, I'm not going to say that there aren't people like that in the department, but I've worked with just about every kind of person you can think of. I've worked with people who are born again Christians. I've worked with atheists. I've worked with communists. I've worked with them. You name it. You can just close your eyes and think of a different person and they're out there as a police officer, a detective. The job does take its toll on you sometimes. It depends where you work and what you do. Some people could have a 25 or a 30 year career and really not go through too much. Or you could have a 25 or 30 year career, especially in a bigger city, and you get beaten over the head with just the worst that society can bring at you almost on a daily basis. It depends on how you deal with it. My favorite thing was going to work out. Some people don't always choose a healthy alternative for that. And like you said, it could lead to um, alcohol problems. It could lead to divorces very high in our job profession. So that stereotype isn't too far off the mark. You know, the really bad hours, working holidays, just being disconnected from your family. It's hard to go to a homicide that's especially brutal, anything dealing with older people or obviously like a six, six month old baby or something like that. You've been on that scene for 10, 12 hours. Then you go home and then your wife looks at you. How was work today, honey? And you're like, Oh, it's fine. (laughs) Yeah. You don't want to be sharing those things in your home space because it's, it's pollutes it in a way. Why did you go into the police? And what are some of the reasons people do go into the police that keep them going when things are so bad? There's a couple of different paths you can go. For me, I grew up, I was born and raised in Chicago as a youngster. And (laughs) yeah, I remember one day the Chicago Police Department SWAT team was setting up a uh, search warrant, which involves a dynamic entry where they blow down the door and they're hauling people out. It's very loud and very exciting. I was a little kid and I'm like literally watching it out the window. There was, there was uh, police officers, some of the SWAT guys. One guy had an M16, and the other one had a shotgun. And they were in our backyard covering down for the guys that were doing the entry. And I was thinking to myself, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. I got to do this. And in the back of a little kid's mind, you're just like, wow, that's really neat. And then, of course, watching Adam-12 and Starsky and Hutch and Beretta and all these old police shows, that really gets you going, too. So... I that really spurred my my uh, interest in police work, and then what happened was I I went to we moved up to Wisconsin when I was in high school. I went to college in Wisconsin, and I started out actually as a music major. I was going to be a band director for uh, high school and grade schools, mm. and I always had the police thing in the back of my head. And I did an internship with the sheriff's department in Milwaukee. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And right from there, I just full steam ahead. I'm like, yeah, I should be a cop. So that's what I did. So that's interesting. So you mentioned there the the kind of exciting and I guess the curiosity. It's wow, this looks interesting. This could be an interesting career. And I'd imagine it certainly is interesting in many different ways. How do you think other characters? So if people are writing characters from the police, what are the other reasons that you've seen that people go into the police? So for example, we see in movies and books, someone's parent or sibling has been murdered for example and they decide to get into it because they want to right the wrong you're absolutely right about that because i have worked with people like that and my good friend adam richardson from the writers detective bureau podcast yes i I have a podcast now the cops and writers podcast it it will be up and running by the time this goes live and i interview it's going to be interview based and i interviewed adam and one of the reasons he got into police work is he had a friend who was assaulted went back when he was in college or maybe it was high school and but he just saw how wrong that was and he wanted to do something about it that's not uncommon and also what i see a lot of is police families grandpa was a police officer dad or mom was a police officer there's generations of police families that's not uncommon 
So you grow up and mom or dad in uniform and you hear some of the cool stories or you you look up to them and you want to go down the same career path. Is there such a thing as a a calling, do you think, to go into the police or or law enforcement? A bit like some people say, I just, I want to be a doctor because I want to help people. I think so. You have to have that mentality in order to be a good police officer. If you're going to do the job, you should want to help people. That's at the core. That's the base of what the police do every day. But you want to help people. You think that, okay, this cop has given me a ticket. You're going to be grumpy about it or whatever else. The reason why they're out there doing traffic is to prevent auto accidents. That's the whole reason why somebody will stop, a police officer will stop a speeder is to try and prevent accidents. So they're trying to right somebody's improper behavior. So that's the way that works. But yeah, at the very core, Yes. You're absolutely right. It's It sounds corny and maybe a little cliche, but it's very true. Yeah, I think the basis of every cliche is the truth. But I think, as you said, it's about making the character nuanced. Even if there are two people who go into it because they want justice, there are different reasons why. So that's really important. In fact, before we I started recording, you mentioned survivor's guilt, which it's just, it's really interesting to me. And that is something I, I haven't actually heard before from a police officer. So could you explain what do you mean by survivor's guilt and why is that something that you've felt? And does that bring more nuance? Survivor's guilt, I guess by definition would be somebody that's in the military that was in war and they have say like friend or friends that didn't make it home. And they're thinking to themselves, how come I made it home? There is survivor's guilt with police officers. You know, I was retired when all the riots were kicking off in the United States. And my fellow officers were working 20 hour days trying to keep the peace. And you know, one of them got shot. And it was very difficult to watch this on TV because I know what was going on. I've been in riots before. I've been on I've been on the line. I've had rocks and bottles and all kinds of things that I don't want to talk about thrown at me. And I felt terrible that I wasn't out there with them because I was their boss. So I should be out there with them. So my wife did remind me though. She said, You've been in lots of riots. You've had all kinds of stuff happen to you. And I'm like, I know, but so that was tough. I didn't do a whole lot of sleeping during those times. That's interesting because obviously one of the core important things about writing is conflict and external conflict in a riot is very obvious. It's like people throwing stuff and then there's the cops on the other side or whatever. But what you're talking about is almost an internal conflict of you wanting to get back there and help your colleagues, but equally you're retired and you're fighting against that. Well, I can't be there. And also there's your family. And so it seems to me that the, the, the conflict, the internal conflicts for police officers can be very extreme as well as the external ones. Yo, you're absolutely right about that. There's all kinds of emotions. And like I said before, I had police officers come from different countries, different backgrounds. I just, um, especially I think bigger city departments, they're melting pots of different people and they have different views on different things that are occurring, but they have to be professionals and they have to do their jobs. So sometimes that is a bit of a conflict. And I think that would make for some good uh, storylines. Yeah, we won't get into politics as such, but no. in America, in America, your <laughs> Please don't. Situation... <laughs> no, exactly. But it's interesting because, I mean, you mentioned someone being a fundamental Christian, for example, and there might be uh, someone, let's say an atheist in the department who feels very differently about, let's say, a capital punishment, which is still uh, happens sure. in some of your states in America. And I imagine mm-hmm. a conversation like that around justice is if people have very fundamental views of what is justice, that can be quite different. So ha- if there are two uh, police officers in a department who violently disagree on some of these huge things, how is that kind of conflict? How does that reach resolution? How do people work together? I was a sergeant, so that's something that I'd have to keep an eye on. Most of the time, everybody's professional. And if it started getting a little heated, you know what, you two can go out for a beer after work or a whatever and fix it then. This is not the place for it. So you can do whatever you want, but do your job and do it right here. And then if you want to resolve whatever differences you have later, please go ahead, but not at work. 
Mm. What about when people disagree with what happened in terms of justice? So again, what I've learned <laughs> from your American TV shows is that what is legal and what might be illegal doesn't necessarily result in a punishment that is relates to the crime or that people might disagree or want to arrest someone or they know someone is guilty and they, there's just no evidence or whatever. So how does that internal conflict work with, I just don't think we did this right? Or how do we sure. do a better job? That's not unusual. Police officers, like I said, they want to do the right thing. If somebody's breaking the law, they want to arrest them. And in order to arrest somebody, there's some fallacies with this. In order to arrest somebody, you have to have probable cause. And the technical definition would be the quantum of evidence that would lead a reasonable police officer to believe that this person committed a crime. So that's enough to arrest somebody. And when you arrest somebody, you take away their freedom. They can't leave. They have to go with you. And then the case gets reviewed by a prosecutor. And prosecutors, most of them in the U.S. are district, assistant district attorneys. Actually, I just um, interviewed one for my podcast a couple of days ago. And what happens is they review the case. They'll look at all the police reports, body camera, evidence, they get everything and they decide is okay. Joanna, maybe she punched Pat in the face, but it was under these circumstances. So either I'm not going to charge this crime or I'll knock it down to a lesser crime from where the police officers thought it should be. So sometimes you have that and there's a bunch of checks and balances when a police officer goes out and arrests somebody and police officers are the ones who do the bulk of arresting. What on TV and movies is detectives are going out there doing everything where it's the exact opposite. First of all, there isn't a lot of them. Mm. And secondly, they usually respond after everything happens. They're not responding to hold up alarms. They're not, they'll respond to a homicide, but they're not the first ones there. The police officer and the sergeant set up the crime scene, etc. I've been to hundreds of homicides and usually it's about a half an hour, 45 minutes, sometimes up to an hour before you see a detective come. They're investigators. They're not first responders. Unless it's a small department and they use detectives to augment their uh, patrol, then that happens. But circling back, it, once somebody gets arrested, a police officer arrests them usually. And they get sent to a district station where they get fingerprinted and their picture taken and all that good stuff. And the police officer or officers will write up the rest reports. And usually that takes two, three, four hours. It, it can take quite some time, depending on how complicated the case is, if they have to inventory evidence, et cetera, question the prisoner. And then all their paperwork gets reviewed by a boss. Usually that's a lieutenant. And then the lieutenant could look at this paperwork and say, no, you're missing this and this. Either charge them with something different. And I've had it too, where I've released people from the booking room. And it's, you don't have enough. Mm. And you're going to make some cops very angry with that. But it has to be done right every time. It has to be consistent. So there are checks and balances when it comes to, you're going to have a little bit of uh, hard feelings because you might have had a cop that, put a lot of time and effort into this arrest and their boss would be like, no, you don't have enough, or I'm going to change it to this charge instead. Then it goes off to the DA and they have a tougher burden of proof. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this person did it. They have to assume that it's going to go to trial and they have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt to the jury that this person committed this crime. So they have that on their plate and they are overworked and underpaid. They really are. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I think we often see, oh goodness, the eye rolling around the amount of paperwork, but that clearly is part of it. And so it, you mentioned homicide there, and obviously that is probably the most common thing that we see in crime and in crime books and movies mm -hmm. and things like that, because 
that is something that is hugely personal and death is a big deal. But I it, wondered. It, I mean, it is very final, yes. Yeah, it's very final and <laughs> it's horrific and there's all this stuff. But yes. are there some underrepresented and potentially interesting plot threads that you think you just don't see enough of? Because it's, yeah, there's a, here's another book. Oh, here's another murder and I know who did it and that's not interesting. And I don't, obviously, I don't want to <laughs> make that it, it, to sound too blase, right. but what are some of the things that you're like, I never see this. It all circles back to emotions. Most homicides aren't something that's plotted and planned out for years, like what in TVs or a movie. A lot of times it's a crime of passion or it's you just think emotion. You know, a lot of when it comes to homicides, revenge, revenge, anger, jealousy, greed, or a lot of times, and you don't always see this in TVs and movies, is somebody is in the middle of a minor infraction of the law, and it turns up being a homicide. You have some college kids that are going into the inner city to buy marijuana, and before you know it, now it's a ripoff. They're getting robbed, and they start fighting with these people, and then before you know it, you have a dead kid. So things can escalate really quickly. Or another thing that you could do is there was an old, I think it was Alan Alda was in this movie where he's driving with his wife, like on a nice Sunday afternoon and a drunk driver plows into their car and he gets out for the first couple of minutes. He's in a fog. He's obviously probably has a concussion and he, he looks over at his wife and she's dead. And the drunk driver is stumbling around. There's beer cans inside of his car, you know, da, da, da. And he takes them out. And this is a person who ordinarily isn't violent. And he start he finds like a crowbar or something. It just starts beating this guy over the head with a crowbar. And he's literally killing this person, this drunk driver. That's the heat of the moment kind of thing. And he looks over and his wife is waking up. And he's, oh, she's not dead. Oops. Okay, that didn't turn out so good. So something like that. I, I like those kind of plot twists. And you can mm. never go wrong with blackmail. Somebody has way too much to lose. Somebody's oh, that's brilliant. Blackmailing. You can never, you can never go too wrong with blackmail. Not, no, that's not at all. You can't go wrong with blackmail. Think of all the great plot twists you could go there. You have somebody who's respected in the community, has the white picket fence, the wife and two and a half kids or whatever that is. And, you know, they did something dastardly. And somebody knows about it and they're slowly sucking the life out of them, either with money or whoever, who knows what else. And so I think those always makes for really good stories. Mm. Yes. And the idea of something to lose is a big thing. You mentioned even the guy there with, with the wife. It's like his the thing he thought he'd lost was his wife. And that leads to a reaction and uh, blackmail. There is there has to be something to lose for blackmail to work. Correct. And so that is a a big deal as well. Anything else other than murder and blackmail that you think, yeah, I want to see more of that? <laughs> that always pops in my head. Robberies are always fun. In one of my books, I went over like the different types of robbers that are out there. A lot of it is drug related or some of it is gambling related. They have debts from gambling that they can't pay or they're, they're drug addicts and they have to steal in order to get their fix. And this is a true story. I had a bank robbery. I get called for a silent alarm at a bank myself and all my guys get there. And the guy that robbed the bank was already gone by the time we got there. And usually they're wearing sunglasses, a hat, some kind of disguise gloves. If they're wearing a hooded sweatshirt, that's up. It's very obviously they're trying to conceal their identity. This guy had none of that. He was just wearing jeans and a t-shirt. And he passes a note to the teller and says, give me all the money. And she's thinking, and they're trained to comply, which is fine. You don't want to get into you know a shootout. It's not worth it. And so we get all the information. Detectives show up. We do everything. And then we leave. The next day, at the same time, the bank hits a silent alarm. And we're like, no way. Because a lot of these alarms are false alarms. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to be on your, you want to be on your guard just in case it's not, but it's in the back of my head. There's no way they got, they're getting robbed the same time from what happened yesterday, but we all went there and the guy that robbed this bank was sitting in the lobby, just in a chair, just looking at us. 
and I recognize him from all the still photos and the video. So we arrest him and I'm like, dude, what, what's going on? He said, I owe the dope man $5,000. And he said he was going to kill me and my family if I didn't pay him. So I knew I was going to go to jail. So I thought I'd just make this easy. Ah. And I'm like, okay, no dramatic shootout, no no negotiations. Out there. The guy's just sitting there waiting for us. He would have put his own handcuffs on. Which is interesting. And I think it's interesting. You said drug addict. And I feel like in people's minds, a certain image comes up from all of the media that we see. But right. what's interesting now, especially in the US with the opioid uh, crisis and the painkillers that people need, is that a drug addict could be someone who is a bank manager. It doesn't Oh, absolutely. This, yeah. So this kind of white collar addict is i don't even know if that is even more common now or people who've um moved into that area and you mentioned theft have you seen it's called lupin or lupin on netflix uh, it's i have a french not. as we're recording this in january 2021 it's on netflix and it's about basically a gentleman thief who oh. is charming and lovely and doesn't hurt people but he does some really good heists and so you very much like the bad guy and the police are not, you know, uh, chasing him, but they seem more stupid than he is. <laughs> so <laughs> I wondered, what are your thoughts of about making our villains or our antagonists also more complex rather than just here's a stereotypical drug addict or thief? How can we make them more nuanced? Yeah, like you said, they're stereotypical, like drug addicts or thieves, whatever the case may be. And there's reasons for that because most of them do fit into that, that that niche. Because as far as say a drug addict, you might be a drug addict, but you could be functioning for a while. Usually, unless you get some kind of help, you swirl down the, the tubes pretty fast and that's pretty much done. But again, it's all about emotions, that type of thing. There are some there are some crimes and criminals where you don't need Sherlock Holmes to figure these things out. I'll give you an example. I responded to a dead body at a, a hospital when I was a police officer, and it initially came in as a shooting because she had two holes in her chest, and she was already passed by the time I got there. And the doctors, we did an x-ray to see if there's any metallic you know, objects in her upper body where the holes are, and there's nothing, and there's no exit wounds. He says, I, I don't know what this is. And I'm like, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> and the backstory was that this guy was at a bar and he started chatting with a gal that was next to him. And this guy was probably in his eh, mid to late sixties. And she was in her mid thirties, early thirties. And one thing led to another and he was, she was going to spend the night at his house. So he drives her to her house first. She says, I just want to get some toiletries and some clothes for tomorrow. And he's okay, fine. So he drives her to the to her house. Unbeknownst to him, her girlfriend, who she lived with, wasn't very pleased that this was happening. And she stabbed her in the chest with a barbecue fork. That's what the two holes were. The homicide detectives get there, et cetera, at the hospital. And this guy actually stayed there, which is unusual. I've had... If you were ever a cop in a big city where there's a hospital, it's not uncommon for people to dump a body like by the emergency room and take off because they don't mm -hmm. want any part of it. But this guy stick, stuck around. He told me this story and I'm just like, no way. Okay. So myself and the homicide detectives were like, do you remember where this house was? And he said, yeah. So he takes us to the house and we're still trying to figure all this out. We didn't know that she was stabbed with a barbecue fork. And we go to the front door, we knock, and this gal's girlfriend opens the door, and she looks at us, and there's just that moment of silence. And then she said, but it ain't like I killed the bitch. <laughs> we all look at each other as I actually did. And the barbecue fork was in this kitchen sink, and it couldn't have been more simple. You're just like, wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> But it was that just, I bet it wasn't even a minute where everybody just stared at each other and didn't even say anything. It's, yep, this job, you just never know. You know what I mean? But yeah, not everybody is a master villain. That's for sure. And 
a lot of times. But what's the what's the percentage of? So that's just that was a mistake. That was a moment of bad judgment, stabbing your friend with a fork, <laughs> and she it wasn't you know premeditated murder. Right. What, do, do, in terms of the cases that you've seen, are there evil genius types? No, very clever not criminals. Not at all. Not at all. Mm. Most of them are drug related. A lot of times, if somebody is dealing drugs in an area where they shouldn't be, they have turf. So a rival drug dealer is going to go by and just kill you. They're they're just going to shoot you if you're going to be doing that. Or like I said before, they're going to rob people and sometimes those turn into homicides. There are some, there is some organized crime. Like you could think of back in the day with the mafia or motorcycle gangs, but a lot of those have been eliminated, but drugs or prostitution are big business. And if somebody messes with that business, then they're going to wind up dead. So that is somehow pe- that is how some people wind up dying. But a lot of it is street level stuff. That's what I dealt with or crimes of passion. And of course, we're not minimizing how uh, terrible the results of crime are. But obviously, people listening are either writing crime <laughs> or <laughs> right. reading crime. So we're interested in the uh, more nuanced characters and the more interesting plots that people have. Because I feel like there was the show Lupin that we literally just finished watching it last night. It was very nuanced because you felt emotion, like you say, for the thief. And you thought, you know what? He's a good guy, even though he's committing... Uh, theft <laughs> quite a lot right. of theft and he's still doing these big heists but we still like him more mm-hmm. almost we like him more than the the police who are just following the procedure and doing everything sure. right but we're not so emotionally involved and that's obviously the skill of the screenwriter and you consult Correct. with uh, screenwriters as well don't yes. you and what are the, the any other common issues in people's books or screenplays that you pick up on Quite a few things, actually. Just again, when we're talking about even just what an arrest is, a common trope, some of the common tropes are don't leave town until this is resolved. I can leave town if I want, unless I'm arrested and a condition of my bail is I can't leave town. They might put like a bracelet on you or something like that or give you geographical restrictions for your bail. But if you're not under arrest, I I can go wherever the heck I want to go. You can't tell me that or the let's bring him in for questioning. You can't, you might as well say, let's bring him in for kidnapping because you're kidnapping this person. If they don't want to go (laughs) (laughs) way to go. What would you you say? What would you say instead? It's either you're arresting somebody or I'd like to interview this person, but you can try and say something like, Hey, you know what, Joanna, I'm trying to clear some things up regarding this burglary. Would you be able to meet me at the district station at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning? Or you're at a crime scene and it's, you know what? This is so chaotic here. There's fire trucks. There's, you know, a zillion cops here. It's loud. It's noisy. It's really hard to concentrate. Could we go to the station where we could sit down and just have a conversation about this? But I could say no. Yes, you could. And I've got one of two choices. Try and make do with what I have. And that could be interviewing you in my car, which is done all the time. It's better to do it at a, in a police station or I arrest you for say obstructing, but that's a slippery slope. You don't want to do that too much because then you might screw up the entire case. Mm-hmm. You know, I could say you're obstructing an investigation, Joanna, and, you know, we can't have this, but you, know, you don't want to do that all the time either because you know, you can only arrest somebody so many times. So yeah, it, that's and that's where the skill of a detective or a good police officer comes into play, where they're very smooth and sometimes they're they're requesting something, and it's very non-confrontational. What you see a lot on TV and movies is the detectives, especially detectives, you know, screaming at these people, especially during an interrogation, or they're hitting them, or they're putting a gun in their mouth, or all these things that would send them to prison are going on. <laughs> It's yeah, very because, dramatic, though. It's not yeah. nice, polite paperwork. <laughs> right, exactly. But the good detective, the good police officer who does a good interrogation is the one who is smooth as silk. They'll have this person signing a confession before they know it. You know, what I would do 
one of the most common things when I was working at night as far as catching somebody in the act of something would be auto thefts. There was a ton of auto thefts and those turned into car chases. And after car chase, there's, there's usually a crash and a foot chase. And then you arrest the person that was driving the car. And I always, after the person is arrested, et cetera, I would interrogate them and nine out of 10 times or better, I would always have a confession. And a lot of times I would do it as an apology. And it's, you know what? That car that you stole from that person, they're not rich. They're living in this neighborhood. He's probably like a roofer or a contractor or some kind of general laborer, and he needs that car to go to work. Now he doesn't have it. He probably doesn't have car insurance, and it's because of you. Him and his family are really in dire straits now because of you. And before I know it, I'm like, you know what? I'm sure you feel bad about it. Here's this piece of uh, paper and this pen. I want you to write an apology to these people. Some, that's a good that's a good angle it's a good yes angle. and sometimes they wouldn't but many times they would or i learned to question people by listening to detectives when i was a rookie cop you would arrest somebody say like at a homicide scene you would take them downtown get them fingerprints and they get searched and fingerprints and pictures and all that good stuff and then they go to the detective bureau where they had the little interrogation rooms and they aren't very big but they're like a, a glorified closet Hmm. with a chair and table and all that. And I remember I listened to one interrogation and the detective that was interrogating this guy, I knew interrogated Jeffrey Dahmer. So I'm like, Oh, I'm going to learn a ton from this guy. And boy, he was the most relaxed. He goes in the room. This guy was, Oh, was it a shooting? Yeah, it was a shooting. This guy just shot somebody, but the person didn't die. And he walks in there and I secured them. They're, they had these big brass like rings attached to the wall and you would handcuff people to that. They'd have one handcuff on their wrist and the other handcuff would be on that. This detective walks in, throws him a handcuff key and it says, Hey, get those things off. I bet you're not comfortable. And the guy's eyes was like got as big as saucers. And then he sits down next across from him. He said, man, we got to talk about this. You know, he Mirandized him. He did everything according to the letter of the law, but he did it in such a smooth way. This guy was spilling his guts. <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of it is personality and you don't have to raise your voice all the time. Sometimes I would for dramatic effect, but all these what on TV and in movies where they're just constantly screaming at these people and beating them up and doing all this. Other, that's a bunch of BS. Then what are the good shows if people want to watch a tv show or read a book where you say yeah that's good i was thinking (laughs) when you were talking there about true detective the first series which seemed really like that it was more about character than anything else but what do you think what do you think are the best shows that are realistic not many now you can get bits and pieces out of them but for the most part i think they're all garbage there's (laughs) entertainment value to these I was watching, I watched all of Southland. It was on TBS. And then I think it's on Netflix now. And one of the things my wife and I watched during all the lockdown stuff was Southland. And the first couple of seasons were really good. They got the banter between the cops spot on. And, but obviously, you know, the cops are chasing somebody. They get into, you know, they're fighting with this person. Somebody gets hurt, et cetera, et cetera. And then they turn around and something else really crazy and exciting happens. Usually, even in a big city, you don't have that much stuff happen in one shift. And it doesn't show, and it can't show, you sitting down and writing reports for five hours. Yeah, that's too boring for a TV Oh, show. God, yeah. And <laughs> then he used a colon. And then, <laughs> then he did some paperwork. <laughs> yes, he's typing away, and he used too many commas in that sentence. And, oh, my God, his sergeant screamed at him for that. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, that's not very exciting stuff. Well, Southland is a good, you know, if the first couple of seasons were good. But I, I have one last question because we're almost out of time. This is like wow. an ask you question forever. But now you have, obviously, you've got books and you've got your podcast. I'm sure 
people will check that out. But my last question is around technology, because what really annoys me is you see something on a show and you're like, but that's ridiculous because they would have their cell phone or they could, it's, you can find who people are really easily. Like even the show I just mentioned, Lupin, it's, I'm sorry, they would find this guy much more quickly because of CCTV. <laughs> it was set in the middle of Paris and okay. they would find him with CCTV. They would find his wife and therefore find his address. Like, why are they not finding him quicker? So how has technology changed police work uh, for better and for worse? I have come full circle. When I, st- when I started, it was almost 26 years ago, we hand wrote all of our reports or used a typewriter with carbon paper, mm-hmm. lots of whiteout, et cetera. Now everything is on on computer. Everything's computer-based. When I was, and which is good because you have spell check. I remember the assembly where I'd be handwriting these reports. There was dictionaries all over the place. You know, good luck finding a dictionary anywhere anymore. You know, those are fossils. I'm a dinosaur, but it is easier to read reports. My handwriting was atrocious and there was some cops. I later on, I became a boss and I'm reviewing these reports and I'm like, did a third grader write this? I'm like, oh my God, what school did you not go to? Oh my Lord. Because when you write a police report, a lot of eyes are going to be on it. That could, you could be reading this report or somebody else could be reading this report in a trial. A district attorney is going to look at this. Their defense attorney is going to look at this, a judge, a jury. You don't want all these people thinking less of you. You're not going to be looking very professional if you write a horrible report. So that's part of it. Computers and squad cars. When I first started, there were no computers and squad cars. Now there are. It makes things much more efficient. Before we would have to call in, I would say I do a traffic stop on you, and because you're in a high traffic, you're in a high crime area. A shooting happened, and your car matches the description of the car that may be involved in the shooting. So I stop you. And in the old days, I would approach, get your driver's license. If you had one, most people in these areas do not have a driver's license where I worked. And you try to figure out who this person is. So you're on the radio with a clerk at the district station or a police officer that's typing away on a very old computer trying to figure all this out. Whereas now you can type it all in your squad and you have, it comes back fairly quick and you can even get a picture of this person. So Hmm, that's kind of. I was going to say photos and video must be a a big deal. Do all police um, wear a camera now on their uniform? Mm -hmm. Not all. I was going to say, but backing up to the computer, that's great that it's making it much more efficient in a squad car. But the con is cops, are their faces are down looking at this computer when their eyes should be up looking at their environment. Mm. So they're, it's more dangerous for them to use it, I think. As far as squad and body cameras, yes, there's squad cameras and there's body cameras, which are both good and bad. They're good in a way that it really documents obviously what happened, but the negative is it's only one angle. If you have any knowledge of photography, you, you know, that one angle isn't always telling the entire story. I'll tell you a quick story. I was following a guy that was, he was a serial burglar. He was burglarizing the heck out of the district that I was in. He probably did. He was good for over 20 burglaries in like less than a week. And we knew who he was. We put GP, we put a GPS, we got a search warrant and got a GPS tracker and we put it, it was a magnetic one that we put under his, his bumper. And once there was enough probable cause, the DA says, yeah, arrest him. I'm going to charge him up with all these different crimes. Then it was a hunt and we had an idea where he was and I, I spotted him a little chase and then we do what we call a felony traffic stop where you have your gun out and you have the person walk back towards you. That's the safest way to do it. Usually they run away from you, but sometimes they actually comply. And one of my partners was backing me up and I look out of the corner of my eye and there's a guy with a cell phone. I'm like, Hey, get out of here. This is dangerous. And he's, I'm with channel 12 news, blah, blah, blah. He was just happened to be there. Hmm. It was just a stroke of luck. And I'm like, well, you better, you know, just, go back. So we got the guy in custody. Everything's great. We recover a bunch of property. I watched it on the, you know, 10 o'clock news and it looked like my partner, I were pointing our guns at each other, but the, but (laughs) we weren't. Yes. 
And I'm like, that didn't happen. I go to work the next day. He's like, yeah, way to go, Sarge. And I'm like, it didn't happen like that. It didn't. And well, also, that's as a, a good one. That camera angle, you're so right. And I was going to say, of course, it, it protects, it should protect both parties. It should protect yes. the police a, a person because uh, y- people will think twice, presumably, about attacking you if there's a camera on you, but also the the person, the other person, because there has obviously been. Uh, occasions where arrests have been a bit more violent than they should have been, for example. So right. in, in my head, it's like the cameras are a net good, but it, you can also see how, as you say, sometimes they're not giving the whole picture and that can be really hard. And and also technology now, I, I wonder how deep fakes and a lot of the ways that technology can be manipulated will also make this more challenging. Obviously, you've heard my podcast, how interested I am in technology right. and a sort of how technology is both a tool and a weapon. It certainly is. And another thing that people don't take into consideration is say something as dynamic as a police officer shooting somebody. Yeah. You know, usually these things happen. I've been involved in seven different officer involved shootings where somebody was killed, where I was the incident commander, I was in charge of it and life doesn't happen in slow motion. Usually it happens within a second or two, if that, mm. and people analyzing it are going frame by frame. That's not what the cops saw. That's not what the police officer saw in the heat of the moment when this happened. So that isn't true to life. So that's one where the body camera doesn't do you any favors. If you're going to, if a jury or a DA or an investigator is looking at this frame by frame, you should look at it in real time because that's what happened. So that's something that is overlooked sometimes. Mm, and yes. And, And one thing that people don't take into consideration is, okay, you want police officers wearing body cameras. Excellent. When you're being arrested at two o'clock in the morning, because you're drunk and belligerent, that body camera is going to wind up. If you goes to a trial or anything like that, they'll play that. Do you want to see drunk you at two o'clock in the morning, calling the officer, all kinds of different X, Y, and Z explicitives. So yeah, now people are like, I've already heard it where, well, maybe body cameras aren't the best thing in the world because they're showing exactly what's happening. And it's hard to defend that if it's plain as day, if it's on video. So it goes both ways. And one more consideration for body cameras from a department point of view is the body cameras themselves aren't terribly expensive, but the storage is crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. So there is a cost. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that the overarching message is that this is such a complex world. And I guess that's why it's such a popular genre to write in and watch on TV, because there's so much conflict. There's all these different nuances and almost that things aren't ever just black and white. Uh, Never. Nothing is. <laughs> yes, not, you not are getting absolutely into race. <laughs> no, it's, it's nothing is ever. I always say it's clear as mud. Yeah, this happened. X, Y and Z happened on the job today. And it's as clear as mud. You're not dealing with a job where everything is very clear cut. There's so much gray in police work. And that's if you're writing a story, use that to your advantage. Yeah, that's where the story is really in the gray. Otherwise, yeah, it would be too obvious. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, so brilliant. So where can people find you and your books and your podcast and your Facebook group online? Okay. I'm Amazon exclusive right now, but I will probably change that for my Cops and Writers series, the books. I have a Facebook group. Just type in Cops and Writers in the search bar and you will find it. And I've got about 3,100 people in there right now. And that's a group of authors. I'm heavily involved in the indie world. I've published, what, five books independently. And A lot of my people in the Facebook group are either beginner writers, and I also have very successful writers in there. And I have all different representatives from law enforcement from literally all over the country, all over the world. I've got UK police officers, New Zealand, Australia, plenty in America, Germany. It's great. It's really neat that I can do this. And I have my own website. It's just copsandwriters.com. And the Cops and Writers podcast that I'm very excited about. That is exciting. And I know a lot of people will come over and listen because this is a fascinating world. So thank you so much, Patrick. That was great. Thank you, Joanna. Just one more thing. Yes. 
I bought your book, Audio for Authors, and I always get the uh, audio version. I mean, I appreciated the fact that you narrated it because not enough <laughs> authors narrate their own stuff. I think it's a lot more genuine, but I liked it so much. I bought the paperback and you have a whole section on podcasting and it was extremely helpful. I have to thank you for that. Oh, great. I'm glad it was useful. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to the show. Thank you again. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Patrick today and that it gave you some ideas for more nuanced characters and maybe even some plus ideas. <laughs> Patrick has also just launched the Cops and Writers podcast with episodes on the role of the detective, the Canadian Mounties, CSI and police science available now with more to come. So next week, I'm talking to Stephen Pressfield about being a servant of the muse and writing from the heart. And he also has some very interesting things to say about book marketing, which uh, I can't wait to share with you. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>